from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. This is Update One, the club's official podcast. It features newsworthy stories originating from the NPC facilities, as well as broader topics related to journalism, communications, press freedom, and transparency. In 2016, social media played a growing role in the political campaign, and the companies were so lax that Russia was able to play them wholesale. By 2020, they had adopted policies and hired personnel to prevent a repeat. Now, as the congressional election approaches, they've announced renewed vigilance. I'm Irv Chapman, a longtime member of the National Press Club. On this edition of Update One, we'll hear from the author of a new report from the New York University Center for Business and Human Rights from its deputy director, Paul Barrett, who's also an adjunct professor of law. Paul previously had three decades as an award-winning journalist and editor for The Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg Businessweek after graduating from Harvard College and law school. Paul, the subject of your latest report is how social media have amplified false claims of U.S. election fraud. We can discuss the major platforms in turn, but in general, how have they done that And do they recognize the damage? The main way they've done that is by uh, operating uh, algorithms that favor sensationalistic material. And therefore, they tend to amplify claims that elicit strong emotional reactions. And when it comes to politics, claiming election fraud or ballot trafficking or the delivery of Suitcases of illegitimate ballots in the dark of night are the kinds of claims that will uh, generate a great deal of user engagement, sad to say. And by failing to enforce the policies that they've put in place, whereby they would limit the spread of false uh, and misleading information, the various major platforms have ended up spreading this material and uh, amplifying the tendency that's become so common, particularly in the political right, to make salacious and incorrect claims about election procedures. Well, let's take them in turn. Start with Facebook and its influential subsidiaries. What do they say they're doing to mitigate untruth? Facebook, which along with Instagram, they are both platforms owned by the company Meta, has an extensive fact-checking program, the most extensive actually in the social media industry. Uh, whereby they have relationships with outside uh, journalistic organizations to which they refer questionable pieces of content and the outside fact-checking organizations for compensation report on these uh, claims and come back quickly with verdicts as to whether the information is false or true. It sounds good in theory and a couple of problems though. First is, is a basic problem which will be very difficult to overcome and that is scale. I mean Facebook and Instagram have billions of users around the world who are posting billions of pieces of content. And therefore, even an extensive fact-checking network like the one that Facebook uh, operates, which involves some 80 news organizations around the world, is going to have difficulty keeping up. More problematic is the way that Facebook applies this. When a, a piece of content is determined to be false, Facebook will uh, demote it or downrank it in the feeds of users, meaning it's less likely that people will see it, and they will label it as having been challenged by their fact checkers, which sounds like at least a good step in the right direction. The problem when it comes to elective politics is that they have decided since 2019 to exempt politicians and candidates. So the wide range of expression by people running for office is insulated from this program. Facebook said originally that this was because they didn't want to referee the claims of politicians, which is fair enough. But the point is they wouldn't really, by anyone's standards, have to evaluate each and every claim. The point would be to evaluate central claims, such as an assertion that an election that had taken place was illegitimate or fraudulent, or that the the coming election was going to be fraudulent. And all of those claims, for example, in connection with the 2022 midterm elections are being left alone if they come from the candidates themselves, who of course are highly influential people to whom many, many uh, social media users are paying attention. Well, compare all that with Twitter. Twitter has a problem of resources. 
It has a variety of perfectly reasonable sounding policies. It does not do the degree of fact checking that Facebook does. But Twitter, sad to say, simply doesn't have the resources and, and really kind of admits this to keep up with the vast flow of questionable material. As a result of that, Twitter, which has a, a policy they call their civic integrity policy, um, by which they say they, they take a look at questionable contentions and will uh, label some of them and or remove them, but they do not maintain that civic integrity policy year round. They turn it on just before elections and turn it off just after elections. After the 2020 election, they stopped enforcing their civic integrity policy in March 2021 and didn't reactivate it until August of this year, 2022. So there were 16 months when it, they were on hiatus in terms of monitoring the misuse of the platform. That's a huge problem. When I asked them about it, they said they have to basically triage their resources. And my thought about that is, uh, that's fine. I understand that you don't have infinite resources, but you set this system up, boys. This was your platform and you did it without the, the necessary guardrails. And it really remains your responsibility to uh, deal with the side effects of your services. Well, let's turn to Google and its subsidiary, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube is the premier long-form video platform. By some measures, it is the most popular uh, social media platform around the world. It is absolutely the most popular in countries like the United States, India, Russia, and many others. The problem with YouTube is that they tend to lag behind the other platforms waiting to see what the other platforms will do, and then quietly doing half as much and not really being very willing to explain that. They also enforce their policies in very peculiar ways. Let me give you an example. After the 2020 election in December of 2020, so about a month plus after November 2020 election, uh, they announced that they would no longer tolerate videos that claimed that Joe Biden's election had been illegitimate. It was past time, they said, to allow that. I would say that they should have started that as soon as the election was called in early November. Nevertheless, okay, so from here on out, they're going to ban these. But they said it's a purely forward-looking policy that all of the fraudulent claims up until that point would remain on the platform, would remain available. And the problem with that, not applying it retroactively, is that YouTube is used very heavily as a video depository, as a, as a, as a library that where people go to look for certain material and actually then bring it to other platforms and include links to uh, YouTube on the other platforms. So this left on the platforms to this day and on other platforms a wealth of phony claims about the illegitimacy of the Biden presidency, and I think speaks to a certain degree of lack of commitment, let's put it politely, uh, on YouTube's part. How about the one that's been growing by leaps and bounds, TikTok? Uh, TikTok, which is now the premier short-form video site, and one that is uh, beginning to eat the lunch of Facebook and creating a real threat to YouTube. They want to market themselves as an entertainment site, a site for uh, creativity. Uh, it, it's widely known for its teenage dance fad videos. Uh, but if you go and look at TikTok, actually politics is now all over the place, which is inevitable when you exceed a billion users, um, that some of them are gonna begin to turn to current events and away from makeup and dancing and so forth. And I found that TikTok's basic policies are quite broad and impressive sounding, but that the enforcement was eccentric in the extreme. Let me give you an example of that. One of my first moves in researching on TikTok was just to put in the search term election fraud. I figured I would get a wide range of material, um, some of it claiming election fraud, other debunking, etc. They had blocked that term for use as a search term, which I found uh, like a strange gesture of enforcement. I'm, I'm not sure you particularly discourage people from posting fraudulent material simply by making it impossible to look for concepts as broad as election fraud. I put another term in, ballot trafficking. This is a term that's become in vogue on the right, part of an allegation that Democrats hired large armies of so-called ballot mules, operatives who were stuffing illegitimate ballots into drop boxes. And you search for ballot trafficking and you find a wealth of material. So th this really, th that distinction makes no sense to me. It doesn't speak of an organization that is systematically enforcing policies intended to try, try to screen out misleading material. And by the way, when I got in touch with 
TikTok to ask them about this. They said, oh, well, thanks for mentioning this to us. And uh, we're going to look into all this. And then they went ahead and they banned searching for ballot trafficking, which wasn't at all what I had intended by bringing this to their attention. And again, it, it bespeaks a certain reflexiveness as opposed to thoughtfulness in trying to deal with this problem. In terms of both moderating and algorithms, isn't it sometimes hard to make judgment calls, even to distinguish satire from falsehood? Absolutely. And that's a very uh, fair qualification of, of this whole uh, discussion. And there are other qualifications to offer, and I'll, and I'll suggest a few. This is not an easy or straightforward task. These are not black and white questions for the most part. I mean, I think at this point, it, it actually is uh, black and white as to whether Joe Biden got the number of electoral college votes that the formal record says that he did. But uh, other claims it may be quite difficult to adjudicate. You point to uh, the, the problem of satire. People may write an entire article that's tongue in cheek and meant to make fun of an idea as opposed to advocating that idea. Those types of situations are not the sort that automated systems, even the most advanced artificial intelligence that we've seen developed in Silicon Valley, are yet able to analyze consistently or reliably. This is a huge challenge. I mentioned earlier the scale is a huge challenge because even if you have automated systems, when you're talking about you know, hundreds of millions of posts a day that are, need to be analyzed, a certain number of them need to be further backstopped or rechecked by humans. It's going to be very difficult to, to manage all of that. All of those qualifications notwithstanding, these companies set up these systems uh, and designed them in the form that they now exist. It's as if you built a highway and said it will be a, very convenient and commercially advantageous to have this highway from point A to point B, and you didn't set a speed limit, and you didn't build guardrails, and you didn't put lanes in so no one knew which direction the other driver was going to be driving in. If you're building the highway, you're responsible, someone needs to be responsible for imposing regulation and laws and some order. And in this case, the platforms were built by companies that have profited from them enormously, it's therefore incumbent on them to figure out how to address these problems. Sadly, they didn't do it in the first instance. They were able to put these systems into effect over a period of 10, 12 years when almost nobody was paying attention to it. It wasn't until really 2016 that the rest of at least American society began paying attention to a lot of these problems when the Russians sought to interfere in the presidential election that year via social media. But the complexity is definitely there. You're never going to have a pure, truth-only internet, but I think it's fair to, to ask the companies and to expect the companies to do a much better job than they're doing right now. Well, you talked about requirements or laws. Is there anything the government can or should do? After all, nobody yeah. wants official censorship. Absolutely, and that point is why government's role here is necessarily limited. Because of the First Amendment, which is built on the wise insight that to promote free expression, we don't want to combine the power to censor with the power of government, the power to punish government for the most part, with you know, relatively few exceptions, is forbidden by the First Amendment to interfere with speech, with the press, and as it's been interpreted by the courts, by a, a wide variety of types of expression more generally. So we don't want the government setting content policies for Facebook or Instagram, and we really don't want the government making particular content decisions. You don't want Donald Trump's White House, or for that matter, Joe Biden's White House, deciding what should or shouldn't be said about politics or governance, foreign policy, what have you. Those restrictions do not apply to the, to the companies that own the platforms. They are free to decide what type of content is permissible on their sites, just as the New York Times has almost complete freedom to decide what goes in its editorial columns. The government cannot step in here and just solve this problem. What can they do? I've written that uh, the government could use existing consumer protection authority, which is exercised by the Federal Trade Commission, to assure that the internet platforms follow through on, deliver on the promises that they make, and that this could be regulated in the spirit of consumer protection. The key concept in consumer protection is that companies are not allowed to engage in unfair or deceptive trade practices. And the fact that the social media companies promise 
to moderate content on their sites in a variety of ways and then fail to follow through on those promises, I think is something that the FTC could supervise. And let me give you an example. The platforms already have very elaborate what they call community standards or community guidelines, rules of categories of content that they allow and categories of content that they do not allow. For example, they define hate speech rather broadly and say we we will have no hate speech on our platforms. This is uniform across all of these major platforms. In other words, you can't go on there and single out a group based on ethnicity or race or religion, disability, and attack people in a direct way based on those kinds of categories. If the platforms promise to regulate speech in that manner, um, but they don't maintain automated systems or human content review systems adequate to that task, I think the federal government could say, we've compared your promises to the procedures you undertake to fulfill those promises, and we find the procedures to be inadequate. And an analogous type of consumer protection action, which has already occurred and which is commonplace now, would be when the FTC says to a business, you've promised your customers that you're going to keep their credit card information and other personal data that they provide in the course of doing business with you, you're going to keep that secure. But it's now turned out that that data is in the hands of Russian gangsters. So you clearly are not keeping that data secure, and we now require you to do that. I think, by analogy, the FTC could require the social media platforms to improve their content moderation systems to make sure that they have adequate resources to operate those systems and thereby assure that there is procedurally adequate supervision underway. Again, I want to emphasize, this is not a panacea. This does not involve uh, improving the basic policies that the platforms put in place, but it would provide some oversight and perhaps create an incentive for the platforms to do a better job themselves. Well, we've been discussing social media and their relationship to truth and falsehoods with Paul Barrett of New York University. I'm Irv Chapman in Washington for the National Press Club. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Irv. You have been listening to Update One, the official podcast of the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists and a vigorous advocate of press freedom worldwide. If you have any questions or comments about Update One, send an email to updateonepodcast at gmail.com.